Welcome back. Today we're going to continue our discussion of anti-infectives or antimicrobial agents. Specifically, we're talking about antibiotics, drugs that either kill or inhibit the growth of bacteria. Today's discussion will be on protein synthesis inhibitors. These include drugs like the tetracyclines and the macrolide antibiotics. We'll start with the tetracyclines. Tetracyclines include drugs like tetracycline itself, um, also minocycline, doxycycline, um, those two are probably the most commonly seen ones, doxycycline is pretty common. Um, the tetracyclines are again protein synthesis inhibitors, so they inhibit the synthesis of protein specifically in bacteria or the attempt to um, just target bacterial cells as opposed to our body cells. Um, some protein synthesis inhibitors, like for example, the tetracyclines um, <clears throat> or like um, chloramphenicol, they can be toxic at high doses because at high doses they stop being specific for bacterial cells and they can start to inhibit protein synthesis in our body cells, which is obviously toxic. But at typical normal doses, we see that they are relatively specific for bacterial cells. The way that the tetracyclines work is they concentrate inside the bacterium. And once inside the bacterium, they bind to the bacterial ribosome. And this prevents the binding of tRNA um, <clears throat> to the mRNA and ribosome complex. So typically what happens in protein synthesis is remember the ribosome is responsible for um, connecting amino acids to each other. And then what you see right here, this chain of amino acids eventually becomes a protein. You see here mRNA, which is just the um, like the instructions for how to make the protein. The mRNA tells us which amino acid is going to come next. Um, <clears throat> tRNA, that's this little like kind of cross that you see, this is tRNA. Uh, tRNA will come and the, the anticodon on tRNA that matches the codon and mRNA will come together. And each of these tRNA has an amino acid attached to it. So you see like this second tRNA is going to come bind into the ribosome and it's going to bring its own amino acid with it. And then another, the ribosome will move down the chain. Another tRNA will come bringing another amino acid, right? And that's how the amino acids all get linked together. The tetracyclines target part of the ribosome. They bind to this 30S, this bottom part of the ribosome right here. Well, if the tetracycline antibiotic is binding to the ribosome, then the ribosome can't bind to tRNA, which means no new amino acids can come in. So the, um, the peptide, right, the chain of amino acids cannot be elongated anymore. Um, because the tetracyclines are preventing protein synthesis, most of them are what we call bacteriostatic. Not bacteriocidal. Bactericidal means they kill the bacteria. So like the cell wall inhibitors, like the penicillins, um, those kill the bacteria by destroying the, the integrity of the cell wall. These drugs just prevent protein synthesis. So by preventing protein synthesis, they can inhibit cell growth, they can inhibit cell replication, um, but they don't typically kill the cell itself. They don't kill the bacterium itself. But by stopping replication, the bacteria can't, um, you know, mount a huge infection in the body and it's kind of, it's stopped, it's just held static. And then that allows the immune system to come um, destroy, kill, and get rid of the bacteria without it being able to grow and overwhelm your immune system. Tetracyclines have a very wide spectrum of activity. They're active against um, all different types of bacterium, including some gram-positive agents, some gram-negative agents, protozoa, um, spirochetes, mycobacteria, some atypicals. Uh, it's kind of all over the place. 
Oh, so we use them for all different types of infections. Tetracyclines are common antibiotics used for acne, um, specifically minocycline. We use minocycline um, very frequently for patients who have acne that's unresponsive to some of the kind of over-the-counter things that we would typically use, like benzoyl peroxide washes or washes that have salicylic acid. Um, we use tetracyclines for peptic ulcer disease that's caused by H. pylori. Um, when H. pylori is, is present and is causing peptic ulcer disease, we treat it with a combination of agents that include um, a tetracycline. So tetracycline is um, commonly combined with bismuth, um, metronidazole, which is another um, anti-infective agent that we'll talk about later, and a PPI, a proton pump inhibitor, which PPIs or proton pump inhibitors we'll talk about next semester, but these agents decrease acid production in the stomach. So typically we treat this, um, in this case you see two antibiotics, right, tetracycline and metronidazole, You'll see the bismuth for protective purposes, and you see the PPI to decrease acid secretion. Um, also, we see that tetracyclines are the drug of choice in Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Um, specifically in Rocky Mountain spotted fever, doxycycline is most frequently the, the recommended tetracycline of choice for Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Um, and this is a kind of like an important caveat here is typically we don't recommend tetracyclines, including doxycycline in children under eight years old. Um, however, when a patient has Rocky Mountain spotted fever, as well as if you look down here, anthrax exposure, um, we can use doxycycline. Okay, so doxycycline is given to children if we have these very specific instances of anthrax exposure or Rocky Mountain spotted fever, because in that case, the risks, um, or sorry, the benefits outweigh the risks. Um, we'll talk about some of the things that we see. Some of our, our major concerns though are um, like delayed bone growth, so bone issues. We see discoloration, um, teeth discoloration, we can see in little kids. Um, and those are some of the reasons that we, we would avoid them in children. But again, with you know, very specific instances, um, we, would, we would prescribe the doxycycline regardless. Otherwise, tetracyclines are not typically given to children less than eight years old. Doxycycline is also the preferred antibiotic for Lyme disease. Um, Lyme disease is caused by Borrelia. Um, remember, typically patients will be, um, it's more common, we don't have it down here in the south and in, in Florida, um, it's more common up in the woodsy areas in the north. Um, but patients will typically get this from a tick, right? There's a tick bite um, that will cause Lyme disease and patients will frequently have fever, headache, and then the characteristic bullseye rash. So they'll have a rash that's like a bullseye shape, right? I'm not drawing it very well because my pen's really messy on here but they'll have that characteristic bullseye rash. And that's something that is um, kind of like a, a alert that tells you you're looking at um, Lyme disease. Now again, doxycycline is the drug of choice for Lyme disease in children or in patients eight years old and older. And so if you have a patient that's eight, or older and you're treating um, Lyme disease, doxycycline is the drug of choice. If you have a patient less than eight years old, less than eight years old, amoxicillin.
is the drug of choice. Um, again, when children um, less than eight are given doxycycline, we see a permanent discoloration of their teeth. Um, there's deposits that are in their adult teeth that are still like down in their gums um, or that haven't erupted from the gums yet. The adult teeth get, get discolored spots on them and then when they erupt, they're permanently stained. So this is why we only give doxycycline to, to young children in very specific situations where the risk, um, we don't really have other good choices. So like Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, um, we don't really have other good choices. So in these little kids, we would give the doxycycline despite the risks. Um, but in Lyme disease, we can give them amoxicillin. Doxycycline combined with fluid replacement is frequently used for cholera treatment. Um, cholera is a, um, a bacterial induced diarrhea. Um, it's caused by Vibrio cholera um, bacterium and this bacterium replicates in the GI tract and releases toxins. And as it releases these toxins into the GI tract, those toxins irritate the GI tract and stimulate um, really severe watery diarrhea. Um, <clears throat> cholera is spread by the fecal oral route. It's common to get from um, food or water in like areas that don't sanitize um, the food well or don't have clean water systems. So when traveling to third world, third world countries, for example, um, it's common for, you know, when traveling for people to get cholera, but doxycycline is effective against the bacterium itself. And then again, fluid replacement is really important because the diarrhea is typically a very watery, um, fluid filled diarrhea. So patients are at risk for severe dehydration. Doxycycline is also used um, for chlamydia as well as for anthrax poisoning which we mentioned um, anthrax down here as well while we were looking at the little ones, at little kids. Um, so anthrax poisoning, um, which we'll talk about anthrax poisoning a little bit later as well when we talk about the fluoroquinolones. Um, and so doxycycline for chlamydia. Chlamydia can be treated with doxycycline or with azithromycin. Azithromycin, um, which, which is Zithromax, the brand name is Zithromax, um, but chlamydia can be treated with either doxycycline or azithromycin. And when we say chlamydia, there's a couple different types of chlamydia. Frequently, I, we think of the STD chlamydia, um, that's chlamydia trachomatis. Um, but there's also a different type of chlamydia bacterium that can result in pneumonia or that usually results in pneumonia versus the STD form. So that is important to keep in mind. Um, <clears throat> something to keep in mind when we look at the tetracyclines is that if a bacterium has resistance to one of the doxycyclines, it does not necessarily mean that they, it has resistance to the other doxycyclines. So resistance to one does not confer universal resistance, which is good because this makes it harder for um, bacteria to be resistant to the tetracycline antibiotics. Here you guys can see the spectrum of activity of the tetracyclines. Again, it's pretty wide spectrum of activity with coverage all over the place. Um, we really talked about most of this though. We talked about um, tetracycline being used against Helicobacter pylori and that we use a combination of agents when treating H. pylori. We talked about um, Lyme, Lyme disease and um, some of the characteristic symptoms of Lyme disease as well as doxycycline being a preferred therapeutic option. Um, we didn't mention mycoplasma pneumonia, um, but which walking pneumonia, a community acquired pneumonia, um, <clears throat> which we see commonly in um, young people who are really like kind of cramped together, like um, military camps they mention, or like young people living in college dorms. Um, treatment with a macrolide, which we'll talk about um, at the end of this video, or doxycycline can be effective. We mentioned cholera, 
um, in which doxycycline and fluids is used. We talked about chlamydia, which we can use um, doxycycline or erythromycin for. And then we also talked about Rocky Mountain spotted fever. We'll take a second to talk about the kinetics of the tetracyclines. Um, this first point right here is super important for you to keep in mind because this is something you're going to remind every single patient that you prescribe a tetracycline antibiotic to. Administration of the tetracyclines with any dairy products or any cations decreases absorption greatly. So they cannot take a tetracycline antibiotic with any dairy products or um, any other like supplements or meds that include cations. Um, so dairy products like milk or yogurt, cheese, they should not take them with. Cations are just positively charged ions, right? So these include like calcium supplements. They cannot take it with a calcium supplement. That includes iron, supplements, they're positively charged. Um, magnesium, that's positively charged. Also something to keep in mind is antacids. Antacids like Tums, for example, is calcium carbonate. That's got calcium. Um, here you see another acid with um, <clears throat> with aluminum in it. Aluminum is a cation, it's positively charged. So patients can't take these with, cat, um, with antacids either. Um, if you look at the chart down here, you can see the absorption of a tetracycline antibiotic. Um, the black line is showing you an empty stomach. So you can see this is the concentration here. The vertical axis is the concentration of drug that gets into the bloodstream. So on an empty stomach, you get this much drug. If it's taken with um, aluminum hydroxide and an acid, you get the blue line, so you get this much drug. If it's taken with milk, because milk has a bunch of calcium in it, which is positively charged, you get the red line, right? So you decrease the absorption to practically nothing, okay? So this is a really big deal. It's not a small change. It's a huge deal, and they, they just pretty much shouldn't even bother taking it if they're going to take it with um, dairy or any of these supplements. Okay, so super important. The tetracyclines really have great uh, distribution. They penetrate tissues and fluids well. They penetrate most organs, liver, bile, kidney, um, gums, skin, soft tissue. They've got really good penetration. penetration. Um, they do bind to calcified tissues, so it is possible for them to accumulate in calcified tissues, um, like the bones, for example. And we really see this in um, young kids. That's why we don't give them to children under eight, except for in very, very specific situations, because they can accumulate in the bones and um, the dentition or the teeth. Um, <clears throat> Minocycline and doxycycline penetrate the CSF, so they can go penetrate the blood-brain barrier and can be used for CSF infections. Um, minocycline penetrates the tears and saliva, so because of this, it can be useful in helping to eradicate the meningococcal carrier state. Right? So if you have somebody who's a meningococcal carrier, um, giving minocycline allows you to uh, penetrate fluids that, that not all drugs do penetrate well. All of these agents cross the placenta, right? All of them cross the placenta. And then they accumulate in fetal bones, which interferes with growth, and dentition or teeth, which causes a permanent staining on the teeth. So because of this, they are all contraindicated in pregnancy. For most of the tetracyclines, we see that elimination is uh, primarily renal, so primarily via the kidneys. The only um, different one there is doxycycline. So doxycycline, 
is eliminated in the bile. So that means that doxycycline would be preferred in renal dysfunction. Okay, so in renal dysfunction, doxycycline is preferred. All of the others, you would have to adjust your dosing and worry about accumulation. Um, adverse drug effects of the tetracyclines include GI distress. Um, this is a common cause of noncompliance in patients because it really does upset um, the stomach quite a bit. It can cause some esophagitis, so um, the one way to avoid that is to prescribe capsules instead of tablets. So capsules preferred to reduce irritation to the esophagus. We've mentioned this previously, but the tetracyclines do deposit in calcified tissues. So they do deposit in the bones and the teeth. Um, this causes discoloration of the teeth, um, the primary teeth, and it can cause a um, temporary stunting of growth. Again, that's temporarily stunts growth. The tetracyclines can be associated with hepatotoxicity. This tends to be more at higher drug concentrations. Um, they are very commonly associated with phototoxicity, meaning that patients are um, more prone to getting sunburn. So even patients who don't normally burn or if somebody uh, you know, normally tans pretty well or normally burns in a couple hours, they'd be more likely to burn quickly. Um, so we recommend for all patients to stay out of the sun and use sunscreen. Sunscreen slash avoid sun exposure. The te um, tetracyclines can cause some vestibular dysfunction um, because of that, we can see some vertigo, um, some dizziness, we can see tinnitus. And this vertigo, dizziness, tinnitus is most common with minocycline. So we see this more frequently with minocycline than with the other agents. Uh, we can see um, pseudotumor cerebri and an associated um, benign intracranial hypertension. So because of this, patients can um, have some CNS symptoms, some headache, um, possible blurred vision, and this does reverse upon discontinuation of the drug. So that would be reason to stop the drug. Uh, we mentioned that these should be avoided in pregnancy. Um, they're contraindicated in pregnancy as well as breastfeeding and relatively contraindicated in children under eight. Um, we mentioned in children less than eight years old, there are only very specific indications like Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever or anthrax. Tagacycline is kind of a drug on its own. Um, tagacycline is a derivative of minocycline, so it was made from minocycline. Um, it's the only drug in its class. It's a, um, a glycylcycline, but it's, it's the only one of them. And the reason that it was created was to overcome some um, drug resistance that we were seeing to the tetracyclines. The use of tegacycline is reserved due to its adverse drug effect profile. Um, it has a pretty bad adverse drug effect profile, um, and we do see an increase in all-cause mortality when it's used compared to the other agents. So we only use it um, in very select situations where we have very resistant organisms that are not susceptible to other agents. Um, it works like the other tetracyclines do, like its parent drug minocycline does, in that it binds to the ribosome to inhibit bacterial protein synthesis. 
Um, it's, it's indicated for complicated skin and soft tissue infections, um, complicated intra-abdominal infections, and community-acquired pneumonia. Um, again, it's reserved for situations when other treatments are not suitable. Um, and again, this is because of the adverse drug effect profile and an increase in all-cause mortality. The spectrum of activity is very broad. Um, it covers numerous different types of agents, including resistant organisms. We see that it covers MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. Um, it covers multi-drug resistant strep. Um, it causes VRE, or it covers VRE, which is vanco-resistant enterococcus. So it has a very broad spectrum of activity. Um, <clears throat> It does not cover Pseudomonas. So that is important to come in, come, um, keep in mind. It does not cover Pseudomonas. Um, it does have extended, extended spectrum beta lactamase producing gram negative coverage as well. Um, so pretty much everything under the sun except, again, no Pseudomonal coverage. Um, Ticocycline is available via IV. Um, there's no by mouth, there's no oral formulation at all, so it's typically given in the hospital, but then again, it's only used for these very, very severe infections where the person would be in the hospital anyways. Um, it has good tissue penetration, so it very quickly leaves the bloodstream and penetrates into the tissues, but it has very low serum concentrations. Um, very little of the drug actually remains in the bloodstream. So this is really important. Um, this makes it a poor choice for bloodstream infections. Even when you're giving it IV, right, you're injecting it directly into the bloodstream, but a large percentage of the drug is then going to leave the bloodstream and go out into the tissues. Um, it's not going to remain in the bloodstream. So if you have, you know, bacteremia or like septicemia um, infection in the bloodstream, you want to choose an agent that's actually going to remain in the blood. Um, <clears throat> it is metabolized hepatically. So dose adjustments need to be made in hepatic impairment. Um, there is no dose adjustment needed in renal failure. So it's, it's to give normal agents in, um, in renal failure. Again, the adverse drug effect profile is pretty severe. Um, it causes significant nausea and vomiting. Um, it can cause acute pancreatitis, which can be fatal. So this acute pancreatitis could be one of those uh, reasons for the increase in all-cause mortality, and it's something to keep an eye out for. Um, <clears throat> it can cause elevated liver enzymes and serum creatinine. Those are things to monitor. Um, <clears throat> it also has the additional tetracycline adverse drug events present. So it can also cause um, like the, the vestibular issues like dizziness, um, the vertigo tinnitus. It can cause increased photosensitivity. Um, it has um, what we talked about GI adverse drug effects um, like nausea and vomiting. Also, um, tecocycline decreases the clearance of warfarin, so we see increased effects of warfarin. So that's important to keep in mind if you have patients who are also on warfarin, you're likely going to have to decrease the dose of the warfarin um, and definitely monitor the INR closely while the patient's also on the tecocycline. Um, there is a black box warning for increased all-cause mortality. which again causes us to um, limit use to situations where we just do not have another agent that we can give.
Now we'll change gears and talk about the aminoglycosides. We have mentioned aminoglycosides when we talked about um, some toxicities like glutotoxicity, which we'll mention again a little bit later, um, but now we'll talk about them in detail. Aminoglycosides include drugs like amikacin, um, gentamicin is a common one, neomycin, um, streptomycin, and tobramycin. Um, the aminoglycosides also work by preventing bacterial protein synthesis. Um, the way they work is they either bind to the bacterial ribosome and they prevent the assembly of the subunits. Um, remember that there are two ribosomal subunits and that both subunits have to come together in order to read the mRNA um, <clears throat> and link together the amino acids. So if the uh, ribosomes can't come together, if the subunits can't assemble, then they can't make proteins. Um, they can also cause the completed subunit to misread the genetic code. Overall, the point though is that they prevent protein synthesis in the bacteria. Aminoglycosides have um, or exhibit what we call concentration dependent killing. Um, they work based on their concentration, so meeting a really high, getting a really, really high concentration of the drug. Um, some drugs work by time-dependent killing, so they have to maintain this minimum concentration for a really long time. Aminoglycosides aren't like that. Aminoglycosides aren't worried about maintaining the concentration for a long time. What they're worried about is getting to a really, really high concentration of the drug. Um, so when we give aminoglycosides, we target a really high um, initial concentration. The targeted Cmax, or maximum drug concentration, is about 8 to 10 times the minimum inhibitory concentration. So um, you want to get way higher than what that minimum inhibitory concentration is, and then you can just let that, that drug concentration slowly drop. Um, aminoglycosides exhibit what's called a post-antibiotic effect. Um, the post-antibiotic effect just means that the drug continues working after concentrations have dropped. So you don't have to maintain this high concentration. Um, that The drug it keeps working even after that concentration has gone down. The larger the dose, the larger the post-antibiotic effect is. So um, our dosing strategies kind of reflect that. We tend to give really high doses and then we can give really extended intervals. Uh, with a lot of other drugs, we give um, a lower dose and we give it steadily, right? Like every half-life, we give the drug again so that we can maintain a steady concentration. That's not what we do with aminoglycosides. We get a really high spike and then we just let the drug slowly go down. Um, we call that high dose extended interval dosing. Um, so that's most commonly used with the aminoglycosides. Um, this works. One, it goes along with the way that these drugs work because they are concentration dependent. We just, they work by targeting that very high concentration. Um, also, this tends to minimize nephrotoxicity, which we can sometimes see nephrotoxicity with aminoglycosides. This minimizes that, and it really makes dosing more convenient, right? It's nice if the patient only has to get the drug um, you know, at more spread out intervals. They don't have to get it as frequently. Aminoglycosides are active against a very wide range um, of really resistant organisms. Um, they're effective for most gram-negative bacilli, including those that are multi-drug resistant. So again, they're effective against Pseudomonas, Klebsiella, and Terebacter. Um, we can combine aminoglycosides with the beta-lactam um, like ampicillin, for example, um, which is a penicillin drug. Um, we can combine them. They work synergistically, meaning they, they help each other work better. And then that gives coverage against various different enterococcus species. So, for example, um, ampicillin plus gentamicin are used for um, endocarditis, infective endocarditis, caused by, again, various different um, enterococcus bacteria. Um, <clears throat> we also can see ampicillin and gentamicin used for streptococcal infections. Overall, we see aminoglycosides used kind of for various different types of infections. Um, we just mentioned endocarditis. 
Um, they can be used for meningitis. Um, there are eye drops, um, gentamicin eye drops that are used for conjunctivitis. Uh, we see them used for skin infections, for UTIs, um, for tularemia, which tularemia is kind of a, a rare, odd disease. Um, tularemia is gotten from rabbits. So during rabbit hunting season, when the hunter um, skins an infected animal, they can get the tularemia. They can breathe in the tularemia. Um, or rather, they can, they can breathe in the bacteria and then they can get pneumonic tularemia um, in the respiratory, uh, respiratory tract. So gentamicin is effective um, for treating that tularemia. We do, again, also see that the aminoglycosides are effective against pseudomonas. Um, <clears throat> if the pseudomonas is causing a UTI, we can give just the aminoglycoside alone, so like tobramycin alone. Um, if the pseudomonas is causing pneumonia, which tends to be a little bit more severe, then we'll combine the aminoglycoside with an anti-pseudomonal beta-lactam. So you would use the combination then if it were um, pseudomonas, pneumonia caused by pseudomonas. Now, pseudomonas in general, pseudomonas aeruginosa, um, it typically does not attack healthy individuals. So you don't typically see pseudomonas in most like normal healthy patients, um, but you do see it in specific um, like at-risk patients. So patients who've had recent antibiotics, um, patients who have had prolonged hospitalizations, um, patients with bronchiectasis, um, that makes it a lot more likely to get um, pseudomonas, pseudomonal pneumonia, um, patients with bronchiectasis, um, or really severe COPD. We see that in as well. So that's important to keep in mind. The aminoglycosides aren't absorbed when given orally. So we don't give them orally when we're trying to treat a systemic infection. Um, all of the aminoglycosides are given parenterally except for neomycin. Um, if you look down here, neomycin uh, is given topically for skin infections. So like we'll apply an ointment um, or cream for a skin infection, or we can give it orally. Um, but I just told you it's not absorbed. So when we give neomycin orally, we're giving it to decontaminate the GI tract before colorectal surgery. So we're not giving it for a systemic effect. We want it to just stay in the GI tract um, because that's where it's going to be working. Otherwise, the immunoglycosides are given via injection, um, so like IV or uh, ointment or ophthalmic drops. So we do, do give like neomycin eye drops as well or um, like tobramycin eye drops. The aminoglycosides have relatively poor tissue penetration um, and they have no CSF penetration. That's even when the meninges are inflamed. So even if meningitis is present, which increases penetration, they still can't penetrate the central nervous system. Now, I just told you on the last slide that they can be used for meningitis. So that's kind of weird, right? If they don't penetrate um, the CNS, how can we use them for meningitis? We have to actually administer them directly into the CNS. So if we're treating meningitis, we have to give them either, um, or we have to give them intrathecally. Um, intrathecally or intraventricularly. in order to administer them, again, like directly into the central nervous system because they're not going to penetrate the blood-brain barrier otherwise. They do, however, cross the placenta um, and they can accumulate in the fetus, which can cause toxicity. Elimination of the aminoglycosides is almost all um, into the urine. So they are excreted over 90% unchanged into the urine. Um, which is good in a way because we can use them for complicated UTIs. So good for complicated UTI. Now we wouldn't use these for just your average UTI because again, we have to give it parenterally. Um, most UTIs, there are 
the organisms are susceptible to a lot of other agents, so we can give another agent orally just fine. But if there's a complicated UTI um, <clears throat> that you need something more serious for, then you can give an aminoglycoside because the unchanged antibiotic, the effective antibiotic, gets excreted into the urine. So you literally like just put all of the antibiotic directly into the urine, which is where you need it to work in a UTI. Um, also keep in mind though that you need to adjust the dose in renal failure, okay? Because if the kidneys aren't working right, then you're not gonna be excreting the drug. You're not gonna be getting rid of the drug and you'll have the drug build up, which again, causes a lot of toxicity. Neomycin is excreted in the feces. Um, that's just the one little caveat there, uh, which remember when we give it orally, it doesn't get absorbed. So it just stays in the GI tract and it gets excreted in the feces. Uh, which is why we use it to decontaminate the GI tract. <clears throat> Serum concentration monitoring is necessary. Um, it's absolutely imperative for any aminoglycoside that you're giving systemically. Um, so like neomycin is not systemic. So we don't need to do serum concentration monitoring. But if you're um, administering gentamicin or you know, streptomycin, if you're giving anything um, IV or anything systemically, then you need to do serum concentration monitoring. Um, again, this is imperative to make sure that you have high enough, um, you reach a high enough max concentration to be effective, but also to make sure that you don't get so much that you're toxic. Um, <clears throat> elderly patients are especially susceptible to toxicity, so use extreme caution when giving aminoglycosides to elderly patients, um, and pay special attention to that serum concentration monitoring. The aminoglycosides are um, associated with ototoxicity. They accumulate in the endolymph and the perilymph of the cochlea in the ear. Um, and as they accumulate there, the aminoglycosides are then toxic. And they, again, they can cause deafness that may be permanent. It may be irreversible. We see this happen in, um, in the fetus as well. Again, we said that the aminoglycosides cross the placenta and they can accumulate in the fetus and be toxic. They can accumulate in the fetal ear, causing fetal ototoxicity, so then the baby is born deaf. Um, they also can cause vertigo, again, because of accumulating in the um, endolymph and perilymph, just a different part of the ear for the vertigo. Um, especially streptomycin. Streptomycin tends to be associated with a lot of vertigo. Um, <clears throat> the ototoxicity is directly related to high peak concentrations and extended length of therapy. Hence, concentration monitoring is so important. Use caution when combining these with other ototoxic agents. Um, for example, cisplatin, we talked about cisplatin in the last um, antibiotic lecture, um, loop diuretics, loop diuretics, you guys know, like furosemide and torsemide um, can be ototoxic as well. So caution when combining these agents together because there's an additive effect. The aminoglycosides have some nephrotoxicity. Um, remember we said that they are excreted over 90% unchanged into the kidney um, or into the urine. So there's a really high concentration of aminoglycosides in the kidneys. This nephrotoxicity can range from um, you know, mild and reversible. So just like a slight increase in serum creatinine that goes away. Um, all the way to a severe nephrotoxicity um, that causes, you know, permanent acute tubular necrosis um, or permanent, and we can see acute tubular necrosis. So nephrotoxicity, there's a really high range, and that's something that you need to watch um, and pay attention to. 
aminoglycosides um, in kind of specific situations can cause neuromuscular paralysis. So they can cause paralysis of muscles. Um, again, this happens or is more likely in specific situations when there's a really rapid increase in drug concentration. So when there's a rapid infusion of the aminoglycoside. Um, so it's really important to follow infusion rate guidelines. Um, all drugs are not infused at the same speed. So this should be um, a slower infusion. Also, um, certain patients are at higher risk for this, this uh, paralysis. Patients at high risk include those with myasthenia gravis, um, as well as patients who have concurrent use of a neuromuscular blocker. So neuromuscular blockers include drugs like pancuronium, Um, rocuronium. Patients who would have neuromuscular blockade include um, the patients who are intubated, for example, um, might have neuromuscular blockade. So um, <clears throat> you want to try and avoid concurrent use of the aminoglycoside and the neuromuscular blocker. Um, if this happens, if there is um, paralysis, you give calcium gluconate or neostigmine. Immediately, and that reverses the blockade. So calcium gluconate or neostigmine um, will immediately reverse that blockade. Allergic reactions are also possible with the aminoglycosides. Um, for example, even like topically, so contact dermatitis is common with topical neomycin. Um, <clears throat> contact dermatitis, as a, which is kind of different as opposed to thinking of like a systemic allergic reaction. It's just localized. Um, and that is it, guys. I think we finished this PowerPoint. Um, <clears throat> next time, we'll just continue on with our antibiotics. We'll talk about fluoroquinolones. I um, can't remember what else. We'll definitely go into the fluoroquinolones, though. All right. Thanks.